Hello, this video is about Jupyter Python notebooks and also a demonstration of the Cloud Statistics notebook. So when you first get to the Jupyter Hub, this is what it looks like. It is basically a listing of files that you have in your folder. And the Jupyter interface is a way for you to interact with these things called notebooks. And those are basically Python code programs or code scripts. And you see a number of them listed here. Once you arrive here, there's a few tabs. One is the running tab. If anything is running, we will see that listed here. And this is the list of the files. You probably will not use the clusters. If you wanted to upload any new code that you've developed on your own, you use the upload tab here and you can upload and add things. And I'll also show you how to download if you click on any file. Uh, on the left hand side, if you put a tick mark next to it, I can duplicate that file, I can move it, I can download it, and I can do a number of things including delete. So the one we're going to work with here is called Cloud Statistics. If I wanted to make a copy of this, which is a great idea prior to any editing, I could do it here by duplicating. It asks me yes, I'm going to duplicate it. And you'll see that a copy's been made and it puts a dash copy one on, on the outside of that. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to open it up by clicking on it. So this is actually the code. And I can go in here and I can do file, make a copy. And it does the exact same thing. And notice it was incremented as copy two. If I wanted to change the name of this, and let's just say I wanted to call this Brian, I click on the name and I can rename this Brian. And I can click rename. And now if I shut this down and I go back to the home tab, there it is listed with the new name tagged on. So let's go over now and look at a demonstration of how we navigate these notebooks and how we interact with them. So the first thing we need to do is look at all the different uh, possibilities for how this code is laid out. So we've already talked about the tabs and the functions in the home site and how to open things up and how to copy. The next thing we're going to do is talk about the cells, which are these blocks of code within the Jupyter Notebook. So these are Python code mixed with a number of things, mixed with things that are text or commenting fields, and mixed with output information, which are graphics. So what happens is a block like this is actually called markdown. If you go here to cell, cell type markdown, that allows me to make this a, a cell for text only. It is not to be executed. The cell here, the ones that are numbered, those are called code cells, cell type code, and they're different. The, uh, code, the, the Jupyter Notebook automatically defaults to entering any new cell. So if I want to do an insert cell below, this automatically comes up as a code block. But if I wanted to change it, I change it to a markdown block and I can put in here sample. And now I have um, a text block in there sample. And when I execute that block, it looks like the following. So let's walk through the general pieces before we execute and just show you an example of what a small algorithm looks like. And then we'll show you how to execute and run this. So the first thing we do is we look at the top and we follow it through, suppresses some warnings. That just allows us to uh, remove a lot of warnings that might pop up on the screen. If you're troubleshooting, you probably don't want to suppress warnings. This loads the data cube configuration. This is where the open data cube um, core software is loaded. It imports the API, which allows you to talk to the data. And this gets everything loaded up. Not a whole lot to get started. The next block you will see, anywhere you see in the code where it says change here, this is what you want to look for, for blocks of code where you as the user will be modifying or editing the content in order to run a specialized case for yourself. Other blocks of code you're probably never going to edit because you're not going to know what to do with it, so I would just avoid those. So change here says I'm going to select a product, in this case the product is the Landsat 7 lead apps product, which is a pre-processing scheme for Kenya. 
and then the platform is Landsat 7, obviously. So I can also do Landsat 8 over Kenya, and when a product or when a uh, line of code is meant to be executed, it will not include a comment block. So anytime you see a hashtag like you see here, that is a comment block. All of this code right here will not be executed, but it's only used for commenting. This is the executed code. So this one is saying, I want the Kenya data cube from Landsat 8. The next block of code prints the extents of the cube. It runs the API, it searches in what we have for the Kenya cube, shows me the latitude and longitude and time extents. So what you see here is 2013 year, month, day, year, month, day, and it shows you the information. Let's go a little further. The next thing is we often choose an analysis region. In this case, we've chosen Mombasa, Kenya, where we have latitude range minimum to maximum, longitude range minimum to maximum, and a time extent. You see it goes from January 1st, 2016 to January 1st, 2017. So basically this analysis is for one year, the year of 2016, for a region over Mombasa. And later, the next block of code plots on the screen where your analysis region, the bounds of your analysis region. So let's go a little further because this bit of code here is for assessing the cloud conditions in the Landsat data. The next block of code gets a little more complicated, but what this is doing is it's running a function here to clean up the code to look for clouds and to gather some statistics. Nothing to do here. This is the part that uh, takes the most time where it actually builds the Landsat X array of data and it takes your region of interest, pulls the pixels out, puts it into memory so now we can act on it. This dumps out a table of the information of the time steps in your data. So for instance, we have 0 to 18 time slices. You can see the dates of the particular time slices and the clean percentage. So if it was 1.00, it would be totally clean. There's not anything like that. The cleanest scene is probably number 14 here, which is 80% clean and 20% cloudy. And we go a little bit better and we can plot it. This is a time series plot of the uh, clean pixel area and time. And you can see there's never any time where it's 100% clean but this is a fairly cloudy region. It looks like most of the time it's 60 or 70% cloudy. Very cloudy, actually. So finally, it loads up the DC load, and all we're doing is pulling in the red, green, and blue because we want to create an RGB image. From the utilities, I grab this RGB function, and then here's another block of code where you change here. In this particular block of code, all I'm changing is the index line here. At index equals 1 says give me time slice number 1 and show me the RGB natural color image and that's what you see here. You can see the clouds, you can see cloud shadows that are black, you can see some water and some underlying land. It's rather boring in the natural image because things tend to be a little bit brown, but you get the idea. So let's run this from top to bottom and see how it runs. The way to run a code from top to bottom is to use kernel, restart run all, and I do it like this. As the code is running, what you will see is the lines are executed and a star is put next to a code block where the line is under execution. Once that block is finished, it becomes sequentially numbered. So if you go to the top, you can watch your code run. So if we go to the top, line one's already run, line two, line three, it's loaded up the cube, it's plotted our region, so we're down to line six. Here's line seven, it's now sifting out the cloud information. We go a little further, it created the, the table. Now it just created the plot, keep on going, and now we have our image. If we want to run an individual line, and this is something that's often done a very important step. We can modify after it's run once through and everything's in memory, I can modify pieces of the code and not have to execute the entire thing from top to bottom. So let's just say I want to look at a different time slice. So let's go up to our table 
and look at some other time slices. What if I wanted to look at time slice number three? Notice they start with number zero. Time slice number three, which is 70% clean pixels, 30% cloudy. It was from March 30th of 2016. That's number three. I can come down here to the bottom and at index I change it and I go in there and I change it to three. To execute only this block you hit shift return, watch it execute, give it a moment and it's going to produce the RGB image at index value number three. There it is. So notice this image looks different than the last one. So we have some cloud shadows, we have some clouds, we see the water. So let's go up and do the cleanest scene that we have, which remember was scene number 14 I said was the cleanest. We can go down again, change my index to 14, hit shift return. It's running this block because there's a star. After the star has executed, it'll sequentially number the block again, and there's our final image. So this is the cleanest image of all. This is 80% clean. Remember that clouds and cloud shadows are considered uh, bad for imagery. So everything else is pretty clean and this is a very nice image. So now I wanted to show you a few extra things uh, to help you with housekeeping as well as uh, executing code. If you're running a code and it seems to get hung up or it seems to be stalling and taking a really long time to run, you can always interrupt and stop a process by going into kernel interrupt and that will stop something from running or you could do kernel shutdown which will completely shut it down and remove it from the running list. I do this often if a code I put something in incorrectly it seems to be running and, and spinning off into Never Never Land and never finishing. You might want to interrupt it. You might want to go back, start with a smaller area, and just make sure things are functioning. Another thing to consider is to go back to the Home tab and to look at your Running tab, and you can see what is running. If you have a problem with something not running and you get a memory issue that there's a memory overload, it's possible that you have too many things running simultaneously. So if I only want to run cloud statistics and I know that someone else is not running these, I can come to this tab and shut them down and shut this one down. And now the only one running is cloud statistics. So this one will have full use of the memory for any analyses that I'm doing. So that's all for your introduction to Jupyter Python Notebooks and also a demonstration of the cloud statistics algorithm.